the probably the two key things that the book points out, and this is what I've learned from having studied this subject for 17 years. The first is that UFOs or UAP are an actual physical object in our atmosphere. It's, it's not just a, a ball of fire or a phenomenon of some type. Mm. And the second is that it is intelligently controlled by something oh. that's much more advanced in intelligence than us. Beyond that, I can't draw a conclusion as to where it comes from or its intent or anything else. But, but that are the two uh, pieces of uh, data that I've concluded after 17 years of study. into UAP in a little bit more detail. We are all familiar with the five observables, sudden and instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocities without signatures, low observability, transmedium travel, and positive lift, right? Those are kind of the five classic observables that, you know, happen in the news. There are others are calling biological effects a sixth, sixth of the observable. I'm not sure if that's entirely true. And in the book, you touch on electromagnetic interference, bending light, as you just mentioned, and a lack of obvious propulsion mechanisms. Can we rework the observables into a larger, more comprehensive description of this phenomenon? Yeah. My view of the those observables, Tim, has always been a little different than what you normally hear. Uh, I really see it as two basic observables. The one is the extreme acceleration, because the amount of acceleration we see is the amount required to basically accelerate an object into interstellar travel, because the acceleration you see can reach light speeds within a day. So that, that to me is one of the key components. The other key component, which encompasses a lot of these other, you know, five observables, is the fact that whatever medium the craft is in, it's not interacting with that medium. So there, there are no, there's no sonic boom, there's no heating of the atmosphere, there's no movement of the atmosphere where, you know, a witness says it was right next to me, it took off at extreme speed, and there was no wind, right? So to me, those are the two components that are distinctly different than anything that we're capable of manufacturing today, right? We don't have the ability to accelerate at extreme speeds, and whatever we manufacture, it interacts with our atmosphere. I would completely agree that UFOs have been in this no man's land of a stalemate between believers and skeptics. What do you propose in terms of change that can move the actual science forward? Right. So, so during these 75 years, the organization that we have that has been monitoring UFOs, right, and has been involved has always been the military. And we beat our head against the wall for 75 years, and in my mind, it's time to move and take that role away from the military and give that role to academia and the scientific community. Because the military's role is centered around national security. National security. And if what we're dealing with is something that's an intelligence beyond us, right, then in my view, national security is no longer the key component. Instead, it, it needs to go to the scientific community because anything that advanced, it, it really, to be honest, isn't going to matter what we do if it has a malevolent intent. But all indications are that it's benevolent and does not have a, you know, an ulterior motive or a, a, a 
you know, a bad intent. Now, I could always be wrong, right? Just because nothing's happened in 75 years doesn't mean something might not happen tomorrow. But that's not uh, my view of, of the situation based on all the research and studying I've done over the last 17 years. So I, th I think to answer your question, take it out of the hands of the military, put it in the hands of science. Uh, well, and overall, I agree with that. But, you know, I'm going to jump around on my questions a little bit. I had this one further down. The Fermi paradox was inspired by a cartoon in The New Yorker showing UFO aliens abducting trash cans in New York City back in the 1950s. And that prompted Enrico Fermi to ask, where is everybody? Now, the cartoon itself is saying they're here. And yet he is looking at that saying, where are they? That leads me to wonder if this isn't an example of the scientific community wearing blinders to this phenomenon, and how can we get them to take, I guess, an honest look at it and leave some of those preconceptions behind? Yeah, it, you know, as simple as it, as it might seem to answer the Fermi question, there's actually a lot of components that go into that and why we have such a difficulty with this subject. So in my mind, uh, it's like the, the cartoon. Uh, they are here. By here, what I mean is they have, they have moved through our atmosphere and, and have, I would assume have observed us. But, but so for, for your audience, let, let me, uh, take them back a step. Today, we know that there are thousands of exoplanets, right? And we, yeah. we even have an organization called SETI, which is completely fine with the concept that we have life out there in the stars. And they're even in the terminology we use now is called the techno signature. You know, what is the techno signature that we would see on an exoplanet that indicates there's intelligent life? So for example, maybe it's that on the dark side of the planet, you have light being emitted, right? That would be an indication of a technical signature of life. And there are even academic papers on what if we had techno signatures in our solar system, like observation posts. There have been papers written on that. But as soon as you bring the techno signature into our atmosphere, it becomes like a no-no. You can't talk about it, right? And, and that, that's just a psychological and sociological reaction of us to the concept that what if you have something that's far more in advance than you? Then that means you're really not in control at that point in time, right? As long as it's far away, it's okay. But if you bring it closer, there, there is this, you know, I think it's, it's in our psychology in, in the way we're formed that we resist contemplating such a thing. But I think times are changing. And I think the younger generations are open to looking at this. Ah, okay. Well, so I want to come back to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. If UFOs are extraterrestrial, as you and I both personally believe, there have been worries that this could lead to a national panic like Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast created. Now, the June 2021 ODNI preliminary assessment on UAP boldly stated that UAP clearly pose a safety of flight issue and may pose a challenge to U.S. national security. And when that came out, the general public hardly blinked. So I'm wondering if that could be an indicator that after 75 years of media exposure to UFOs, we are ready as a society to accept the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Yeah, I, I think, and I believe it was a Pew study, which when it looked at um, the acceptance of the likelihood that uh, an extraterrestrial you know, civilization might contact us in the future, the younger generations have a much higher acceptance rate for that than the older generations. So I think as time has progressed, and, and, and the real big change, I think, is all of the exoplanets we've discovered. I believe we're at close to 6,000 exoplanets. So 30 years ago and 40 years ago, when this subject was discussed, there had not been a single exoplanet discussed. Most, many people were not even sure that 
there were other planets around stars. You know, there was always that feeling that we were unique, right? And this is the only place. But of course, today we know that's not the case. So as we discover more and more, and the number of exoplanets out there in my opinion, is far more than 6,000. That, that's limited by the techniques that we use to see another solar system. For example, if you took our solar system and put it 20, year, 20 light years away, the Earth, we could not, with our current technology, detect the Earth. We would see a star, which we might detect Jupiter, or we might not detect anything, right? And, and that's all we would know about this solar system if it was out 20 light years away. So the, the actual number of exoplanets is far beyond the 6,000 we've you know discovered. So that tells us that life is ubiquitous to the universe. It's just everywhere. You know, I tend to agree with that. I did an interview with Dr. Robert Zubrin, who had said that the four most plentiful elements are uh, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and helium. And of course, helium doesn't react with anything, but those other three really form the basis for life, right? So it's very likely that with those exoplanets, especially being in the habitable zone, a lot of them have chemistry just like ours. And I tend to believe that life is all over the galaxy, you know? And then there is another aspect to this, I think. The scientific community tends to balk at this idea that ET may have found us because of the speed of light limit, right? And that may not necessarily be a limit. Different people are proposing warp drives that could potentially get around that. But another premise was put forward by Dr. Kevin Newth on the SEU staff that even traveling below the speed of light, um, ET may have been here for thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of years. And so it's not necessarily that they would pick up our radio signals and use a warp drive to get here. They may have found us long, long ago, right? So, Right, right. And that is, that's also the theory on some papers that have talked about techno-signatures within our own solar system. The concept that another civilization might have sent uh, some type of craft or observationable post into our solar system maybe tens to hundreds of thousands of years ago, maybe even millions, and they would be probably AI or robotic uh, type systems that that might stop like an, on the asteroid or on the moon or wherever and just basically observe the Earth from those locations. So, yeah, that's... Uh, you don't have to be able to exceed the speed of light to travel interstellar. Uh, there's a lot of engineering requirements that you need. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, that's assuming that these are true biological entities piloting these. One of the hypotheses that I've been excited about is this idea of von Neumann probes. And in that case, a lot of these restrictions on travel just disappear. You have these self-replicating probes that could literally be filling the galaxy. They could be living in the ocean, not living, but existing in the ocean, pulling elements out of seawater to self-replicate. And they, at least, would be entirely consistent with what we've seen with Tic Tac, although not necessarily other reports. So there are so many different potential ways that this could come about, right? That, again, right. this goes to just opening our minds to it, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's a, uh, an important thing to do. And, and you know, I wanted to touch back on something you asked him about, you know, the concern people have and, and where I mentioned that the younger generations are, are, you know, not as concerned about whether or not we someday meet an extraterrestrial life form. And that's the, this basic concept that as a civilization anywhere develops, right, it develops the ability to annihilate itself before it develops the ability for interstellar travel. So mm. just take our own civilization. We developed the ability to annihilate ourselves almost 70 years ago, while interstellar travel is at least another 70 years away, if not farther. So 
the the key concept here is that a civilization that's aggressive, which you might classify ours as aggressive, uh, as you read the newspapers every morning, um, that type of civilization will likely annihilate itself before it ever obtains interstellar travel. And the choice for a civilization is to become more benign and not aggressive, right? If it's going to survive long enough to develop interstellar travel. So the, the final view is that it's most likely any civilization traveling between the stars is not a male, you know, malevolent civilization. It's more likely to be a more peaceful type civilization. So hopefully that's the case, but you never know for sure. Signor Presidente, mi ascolti attentamente. Tanto per cominciare, domani procederemo col piano di Uber. D'accordo. Lei è l'unico di cui mi fidi. Ieri pomeriggio le ho detto una serie di cose, cose segrete, segreti militari. Che sta cercando di dirmi, generale? Signor Presidente, facciamo così. Lei prova a indovinare e io nego. Non c'è altro modo, perché se lei sopravviverà, considerata la sua integrità, so che non riuscirebbe a restare in silenzio e cambierebbe il corso dell'umanità. Quindi c'è qualche segreto di cui non sono a conoscenza? Lei non sa niente, signore. Nessun presidente ha mai saputo niente. Ma non sono io quello che parlerà. Io ascolterò e basta. Faccio un tentativo. Terroristi? No, signore. Governi stranieri? No, signore. Americani, qualcuno che vuole vendicarsi? Di nuovo, no, signore. La mia prossima domanda è... e non riesco a credere che lo dirò ad alta voce. La ascolto, signore. Si tratta di alieni di un altro pianeta, allora? Here's where we go into off into the deep end, but I'm just going to say this. Uh, has there been the possibility of an infiltration by some of them into our world? I think the answer is yes. Has to be considered as possible. You'd be a fool to, to pretend that it's impossible. Um, and so then what you look for is, are there, what evidence could be used to support this? And the only evidence that I could use to support it are, is the research of various UFO researchers who have developed, collected their own stories of interaction with human looking non-humans. There's a lot of those. I've, I've encountered a few of them myself from people. Uh, they're quite compelling. I do think that there's a, an element. Just a moment. You've encountered a few. I've spoken. Human looking aliens. Not me personally. I've, I've interviewed a number of people who were quite credible to me. Uh, one was a retired U.S. Air Force colonel with a Ph.D. who had uh, a hell of an experience. I've talked about it from time. I can mention it here. I spoke to a woman uh, who actually I liked her story even more. Uh, housewife from uh, Western Pennsylvania. I met her 15 years ago at a conference. She came up to my table. I was selling some books, you know, uh, with her husband. And she said, I just want to tell you this crazy story that happened to me in 1965 when I was 15 years old. So I said, all right, go. So uh, she uh, was in church with her mother uh, in this tiny little town in, in Western Pennsylvania, where she said everyone knew everyone, especially in church, she said. And uh, so she's with her mom. And she said this couple walked in to sat in front of her. She said they were like supermodels. They were absolute male, female. She said they were just like gorgeous Hollywood blonde. She said they had this most perfect blue clothing that she had ever seen. And she, I think even implied like as a 15 year old girl, I was kind of obsessed with fashion, you know, all of that. But she's, she's studying the fabric of what they were wearing. She said it was the most amazing 
Like they were the most amazing spectacle in this church. And she said, I was shocked that no one was looking at them. She said, I was mesmerized by them. I couldn't take my eyes off them. Um, and they seemed like they didn't quite fit in. And then she said to me, and that's when I could hear them in my mind. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I, I could hear them thinking to each other. They weren't talking. I could hear them thinking. I said, well, what were they thinking? She said, well, it was kind of like one was saying to the other, well, we appear to be fitting in pretty well here. <laughs> and then the other one said, yes, except for the girl behind us who can hear us. This is what she said to me. And I'll just, I'll, I'll pause and I'll just say, this woman was eminently believable to me. It's absolutely credible. So to continue, she hears this telepathically, I guess. And uh, she was kind of shocked. Who wouldn't be? And, uh, and she said at that point, though, I didn't hear anything else from them. So it was as if they knew this security breach and they shut it down. So they go through the rest of church. This is a Catholic mass, by the way. And uh, she was almost amused by the fact that they didn't seem to know how to act within a Catholic mass. I grew up going to Catholic mass. So sit, kneel, do the sign of the cross, you get up, you do all these different things, all these motions. They were, they were looking around to try to do it right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, mass ends finally. And she's fascinated by them, of course. And they get up and they, they're out of the church immediately. They're, they jump ahead of the crowd and they're gone. And she gets into her mind that she is going to follow them. So her mother was sitting next to her, oblivious to the whole scenario. The, the young woman who's telling me the story gets up and she works her way through mm -hmm. the crowd. Her mother is yelling, get back here, young lady. Where do you think you're going? What are you doing? What's going on? And the girl just goes. So she gets to the front of the church and she sees the couple and they've walked across this big parking lot and they're going over this little crest of a hill. And she scoots across the parking lot. She gets to the top of the hill. She sees them. They're walking down this field toward a wooded area. And she starts down after them. And then she stops dead in her tracks because she sees a third person. This is crazy. So there's a man standing at the edge of the woods. She said, do you remember the character Lurch from the Adams Family TV show? Tall, black suit. Uh, she said he looked kind of like that guy. She looked like Lurch. Very tall. And it, it, it intimidated her. It frightened her. And where did this person appear from? From the edge of the woods. He was waiting for this couple that was walking to him. The couple that was in church. They're walking across the field toward this guy. According to the woman, they walk into the woods with the guy. He turns, he walks into the woods with them. And uh, that's the end of her story. That was the whole thing. So it was a crazy thing. It's like, who are these people? Who is, who is Lurch over there? What was this? It's very bizarre. It seems like you've got this group of blonde, blue-eyed, Pleiadian looking. I'm not saying they were from the Pleiades, but these individuals that were very unusual, that appear to have a telepathic capability. And they're, they're going into the church for some unknown reason. They didn't drive there in a car. They're coming through these woods. What's that all about? Um, I got a similar story from a retired colonel. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make this very brief, but basically the same type of story. Uh, he told this to me with his wife, who was present. They were at a Las Vegas casino hotel uh, when this happened. They were with a third friend. And they see this woman uh, that they are convinced was telepathic and an alien. And the reason was the, the friend that they were with, apparently, according to this colonel, was a psychic, a friend of theirs. Who knows what that means? But the psychic stopped and she said to the colonel, that woman there is not, she's not like us. And the woman was this absolutely drop-dead, beautiful, blonde woman in a blue outfit. Of course. It's Las Vegas, and you're going to get that in Las Vegas. But nonetheless, that's what this psychic said. So the psychic and the wife went down an escalator to get away. They were nervous. The colonel stood behind, and he's observing the woman. And he said to me, she was maybe 50 feet away. He said, I, uh, like she turned slightly toward him, and he heard her in his mind, he said to me. 
just like what this other woman said. He heard this woman in his mind, and the woman almost sounded like a police officer on the beat, essentially, nothing to see here, go about your business, this is not anything for you. Like, that's what he heard, and it startled him. He's thinking, what's this all about? And then at that moment, this equally beautiful man, blonde hair, blue, maybe they were in Cirque du Soleil, who knows, really, but he is conferring with her. He can't hear them. They then walk toward the escalator where he's standing. And he's thinking, good, I'm going to, I'm going to confront them. I'm going to say something. And they walk right by him. He says nothing. And then he follows them down the escalator. This is actually hilarious because as they're going down the escalator, the wife interrupted his story to me. And she says, oh my God, my friend and I were hiding behind a slot machine. <laughs> peeking behind the slot machine watching these two that is a comical element to this uh so it was good though that she was there to kind of corroborate this story you know anyway the couple gets down to the bottom of the escalator and they just walk off unmolested they go about their business that's the end of them but what's weird is that the they're the three of them are talking about this afterward and the psychic friend apparently also did some kind of hypnotherapy, regression, who knows? Like there's a lot of people who will do that. And and she says as a colonel, I could regress you and maybe you can remember better what some of the things that you may have heard. I think that's what they were getting into. And uh, he goes to do this with her. And when he does the regression, this is a couple of days later. Every time she's trying to regress him, he hears, they, they hear construction noise outside the house, jackhammers and noise. They go actually to check and there's nothing there. So they give up. He says, look, I'll be, I'll be back in town next month. Maybe we can do it then. So, um, he calls a month later and says, Hey, I'm going to be around. I wonder if let's try that regression again. Uh -huh. She's the, the friend says, what regression? He says, the regression that we did last month. Don't you remember? According to what he said and the wife, she had no memory of that. So of she had no memory of the event. So somehow in the subsequent month, her memory had been tampered with by some unknown group. I think that's a pretty crazy story, but I had no problem believing this colonel who told me this uh, and his wife who was there to corroborate critical parts of it. So what is that? What are these people? Who are they? Are they just regular human beings who've just got gnarly powers and they can get inside your head? Well, maybe. Or maybe there's something else going on. Um, maybe there's a, a faction of beings that are just very quietly hanging out here for whatever purpose. I tend to think that that is true. I don't think they all look human. I think that there are definitely uh, beings that do not look human. Um, and I think that as far as what's the general scenario, I've been taking a long time to get to that, and I apologize. But I think that um, we are, and our planet, are subject of great, great interest right now. Um, I do think there's probably a lot of life in the universe, but I, I still maintain, I think planets like our own are quite special and unique and uh, not a dime a dozen. And when you have, we don't just have life here. We have complex, incredible life that's everywhere. We are exploding with all kinds of genetic diversity. So that's got to be of interest. And then where we are as a species are of interest. Where are they coming from? Are they coming from another planet or another dimension? Are they physical or are they spiritual? Well, I'm going to say I think that they are physical. They may have an ability to manipulate what we would consider dimensions. And I think that's where the interdimensional aspect probably comes in. I don't, I don't know that I would call them, uh, the ones who are landing in craft, the ones who are entering oceans or coming out of oceans or coming in from, uh, an altitude of 200,000 feet down to land on the ground, tracked on radar. I don't think that they're spiritual entities. I think they're physical. And um, they come from somewhere. I assume they come from another world. That they're quite advanced. Um, and figuring out the agenda is really very, very important. And I, I don't know that I've got all the answers as to what the agendas are. Are they... Are they 
benign or are they malevolent? I, I think it's a real fallacy to say that <clears throat> a species that is inherently much more technologically advanced is inherently more ethical than ours. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the new age community, I think, seems to believe this, that these ETs are, are all ethical. And, um, why do you think that is? Why do you think they believe that? They're naive. They're just very naive. They're idealists. They don't know any better. I mean, that's really what I believe. I think, um, it's really pretty simple. There's, there's a lot of naivete in our society about this. Um, now I'm not saying that these other aliens haven't figured out a way to manage their society in a way that they can prevent themselves from destroying themselves. Uh, they probably do that through some form of totalitarian control though. Hive mind. Uh, that seems to me the most logical way that they would do it. You have to control. Um, but I mean, look, if they come from another planet, you have to assume a few things that they, like us, became the apex predators of their world. They would have forward-facing binocular predatory vision. They are used to manipulating the environment. They were, to get to the point of being the top species on their planet, that meant that they had to subjugate other species to do their work for them, which is what we do. We subjugate plants. We subjugate animals. We make them work for us. We take it all for granted, but we wouldn't be able to do what we do without controlling all the other species of the planet. And so they must have done the same thing. Um, and they must have gone through a period of extreme violence to do so, which is what we've done. We've only succeeded because we're violent. That's what they must have done. Now, maybe they're not as outwardly violent anymore, but that doesn't mean they're not used to getting their own way. Now, I'm sure they're used to getting their own way because they're quite good at it. And so they're here now. So what does that mean? Well, they're used to getting their own way. Now, they may support our development. They may have problems with our development. Um, they may understand many, many things that we have not even begun to understand. I'm sure that's true. But does that mean inherently that they have what we would say are our best interests at heart. I don't, I don't know that for an instant. I don't know that for an instant. I have to assume they um, have, as long as they have physical bodies, as long as they need to eat food and have a shelter and reproduce, then I have to assume that they have their own interests. And those interests might coincide with ours to a certain extent, or they, they may diverge from ours to a certain extent, just like any intelligent species would have divergent interests. ISS, this is Mission Control. Please come on. ISS, do you 